1986, a 78-year-old bald man fell asleep in his rocking chair, slipped, fell onto his fireplace, hit his head on hot coals, and suffered full thickness burns across the parietal region of his scalp. Six months later, he returned to the hospital with a full head of hair. The story was published in the British Medical Journal, and it has baffled hair loss researchers ever since. It demonstrated that full recoveries from androgenic alopecia are actually possible, even for people who have been bald for decades. And this revelation all happened by accident because of an accident. So what might explain these results? And what are researchers doing today to try to make outcomes like this a reality for every single hair loss sufferer? That's all coming up. And also, don't try this at home. This is Rob from Perfect Hair Health, and in this video, we are going to be diving into one case report that changed everything we thought we knew about androgenic alopecia and how full hair recoveries are actually possible, even for people who have been bald for decades. Now, pattern hair loss, also known as androgenic alopecia, is one of the world's most common hair loss disorders. It affects over 50% of adults at a cosmetic level, with some studies showing that we'll all suffer from androgenic alopecia if we simply live long enough. In men, it tends to start with temple recession or a bald spot and can progress to a slick bald scalp over a number of years. In women, it more often presents diffusely it's chronic, progressive, meaning that without treatment, it generally just gets worse. And consensus amongst the top researchers in the world is that this hair loss disorder is caused by an interaction between our genes and our hormones, specifically a male hormone known as dihydrotestosterone or DHT. And before we can effectively dive into this case study, we first have to understand some big picture things about this hormone DHT and what eliminating it can and cannot do for our hair regrowth. First, it goes without saying that the evidence implicating DHT in pattern hair loss is incredibly strong. We know that men who are castrated before puberty produce 95% less DHT throughout adulthood than non-castrated counterparts. And typically, these men, they also never go bald. We also know that men who lack an enzyme that converts testosterone into DHT tend to be protected from baldness later in life. We know that DHT is higher in balding scalp tissues versus non-balding scalp tissues. And we know that in cell cultures, exposing certain components of hair follicles to the hormone DHT can trigger apoptosis, also known as cell death. And finally, at an interventional level, we know that lowering our DHT levels with drugs like finasteride or even dutasteride tend to stop the progression of androgenic alopecia in 80 to 90% of men and increase hair volume by something like 10 to 30% over two to four year periods. So in most cases, targeting this hormone DHT to improve pattern hair loss, it is a great idea. It leads to great outcomes, especially if you catch hair loss in its earliest of stages and you get on treatment as soon as possible. But what about people who have already lost a good amount of hair? You know, men who are in that Norwood 3, Norwood 4, sometimes higher stages of hair loss. Well, studies typically show that these men absolutely respond to DHT lowering drugs. But after a certain degree of hair loss, hairs typically don't come back, even if we bring our DHT levels next to zero. This begs the question, if DHT causes hair loss, why doesn't eliminating DHT lead to full hair regrowth? And depending on what research group you're following, there are many different hypotheses. Some researchers say that balding hair follicles, they retain their stem cells, but they lack the ability to convert those stem cells into something known as progenitor cells. So after a certain point of hair follicle miniaturization, bringing DHT levels to zero won't help if you can't fix this step process problem. Other researchers argue that hair follicle miniaturization is irreversible after a hair disconnects from its erector pili muscle. That's a goosebump muscle, because at that point, follicles tend to lose some aspect of their sensory touch with their external environment, which can affect signaling. And other researchers, like myself, have published papers arguing that some of this irreversibility might be driven in part by scar tissue that tends to accumulate around hair follicles in the mid to late stages of miniaturization. In these cases, no matter how much DHT you're reducing, you probably can't make these follicles thicker, much like you can't grow a lot of grass on concrete. Now, these are all plausible explanations, but they're all probably incomplete because when we take bald, vellus, completely miniaturized hairs, and then we transplant those to the backs of mice, 
Those hairs regrow to full thickness and can regenerate in a single hair cycle. A study like this tells us so many things, one of which is that by simply changing the environment of a balding hair follicle, we can normalize stem cell to progenitor cell conversions, we can witness hair follicles reattach to erector pili muscles, we can see hair follicles return to full thickness, sometimes even thicker. And in 1986, for the first time ever, at least according to my literature reviews, these effects were demonstrated for the first time in a human scalp. Back when that 78-year-old man with significant balding fell, hit his head on hot coals, suffered full thickness burns to the scalp, but during the healing process, accidentally regrew his entire juvenile hairline. In my conversations with investigation groups, I have brought up this case report time and time again. You'd be surprised just how few career hair loss researchers even know about this report and who are later astounded at the results. What's even crazier is that this isn't actually the first time or the only time in history that we've seen wounding as an initiator of significant hair regrowth. Since the 1960s, we've known that wounds under the right conditions can trigger hair regeneration. We've seen it happen in burns, we've seen it happen in abrasions, and even in boiling water spills. Although it's difficult to reproduce consistently. Recently, we've even seen new hair follicle proliferation in more controlled settings, like wounds initiated from microneedling. In fact, we just published a literature review on these little medieval torture devices, which I will link below. Suffice it to say that wounding seems to sometimes generate new hair growth, and not just a little, but a substantial amount but we just don't know how to replicate it yet. And that's what I find so fascinating about these reports because wounds to the side of the scalp, such as here, can trigger hair regrowth five plus inches away over here. And that suggests that we even see a synchronization of the human hair cycle. The distance of crosstalk between these hair follicles was previously believed to just not be able to occur. But researchers like Max Plikus and others, they're now demonstrating that this is possible in mice and most likely in humans as well. If you or anybody that you know of has incurred a wound that has later generated new hair growth on the body and hopefully more preferably on the scalp, please reach out to me over email or in the comments. I'd love to talk to you. In fact, I had this happen to me when I was just 16 years old. I slid in the grass catching a frisbee. I scraped off the top layer of some of my skin near my chest. And during that healing process, I developed a small patch of hair that is asymmetrical to the rest of my body hair, yet has remained growing to this day. With better clarity around which injuries can trigger behaviors like this and why, I personally think that we can start combining larger wound environments on the scalp with certain drugs and stimulants that will initiate hair regrowth quite possibly full hair regrowth. And by the way, this isn't the only published case report of complete hair loss reversals for non-scarring alopecias, but even for scarring alopecias like cicatracial alopecias or frontal fibrosing alopecia. So we'll be covering more case reports like this in our next story series. And again, it goes without saying, just because you hear about these things, don't try them at home. So that is all for now. And one last thing, if you're fighting hair loss and maybe feeling torn between a natural or a conventional approach, or maybe you're just confused by the massive amount of information online from your doctors, from dermatologists, feel free to sign up for our free email course on achieving hair regrowth. We'll dive into the DHT paradox, hair growth strategies with and without the drug model, why there's no one size fits all solution for hair regrowth, and how to efficiently and effectively navigate hair loss treatments so that you can stop wasting time, money, and hair. Take care and I will see you next week.